Okay, so POST has two key functions. One is as the science advice unit within UK Parliament. So we provide reactive science advice to select committees in both houses and MPs and members of the Lords. Um, but it was actually created initially as a technology assessment and horizon scanning unit. And this was done um, back in the late 80s when Parliament realised it was a bit behind government in terms of doing technology assessment and understanding science advice. And in particular, Parliament was starting to have to grapple with a few things that were coming on board. One was computer misuse, so the, the rise of potential computer viruses and thinking about legislation for that. Um, there was also embryology and the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Act was starting to come on board. There were questions around BSE and variant CJD. So there's a lot happening at the end of the 80s into the 90s that needed some more dedicated um, expertise from scientists that could take research evidence and bring it into Parliament. So POST was modelled on the US's Office for Technology Assessment and was set up in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and so traditionally, we have done this technology assessment role. We have identified what are the key things happening outside in the world of science and technology, what have been the major steps forward in research, for example, and what might be the impacts of those on public policy? What can we envisage will happen within sort of a five to 10 year time frame? So roughly this parliament plus the next parliament. So uh, half of our work, at least half of our work is at horizon scanning and it's identifying those potential changes and trying to tell MPs and members of the Lords about these before they've really come to the public attention. And then, as I say, the other part is science advice. So that, a lot of that is about being a broker for the academic community. So being a face of parliament to university and industry so that they can contact us and make sure that what we're doing in parliament is based on research evidence. So a good example, as I said, was back in 1990, um, I think it was Post Note 6 that was published, was actually on computer misuse. And this was the first parliamentary publication to really discuss hackers and this new idea of viruses coming on board. And it has this very neat little picture of a virus being introduced into a computer on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. And for any of you that's old enough to remember what those are, um, you know, back, back when I started computing as well. Um, and it recognised some of the risks for this emerging trend at that time of linking computers together, usually as data links within organisations, but also starting to move things onto the public telephone system. And you know, terms like worms and Trojan horses and things were um, introduced then before they were discussed elsewhere. And that post note was, the reason for doing it was because there was a bill going through Parliament at that time which resulted in the Computer Misuse Act. Of 1990. And then from there, Post kept up with the trends to identify new ways that um, cybersecurity had to be looked at. So in 1997, um, we published something on fraud and computer data. In 1998, there was internet commerce was starting to come online. So this idea of the internet, as it was then, being a nascent way of buying and selling stuff. And that was the first place where we started to talk about encryption and introduce the idea of encryption and why it's important. And then in two, 2006, um, the first post note came out on what was then called pervasive computing. So this was the idea that computers weren't anymore just your desktop or your mainframe computer, but were in fact little chips that could be in anything. Um, and it's amazing now in 2020, thinking back to how that was a fairly novel idea that you'd have sensors in your cars, you'd have computers in your cars doing things like braking. Um, and then in 2011, as cybersecurity moved on from being this change in a threat from individual hackers to be a much more uh, a military concern or a national concern to the UK, we published one on cybersecurity in the UK and particularly looking at the impact that that might have on critical national infrastructure. So probably the, the most useful one just to reflect upon today is a post note that we did last year on cybersecurity and consumer devices. And this is actually quite topical for some of the things we're discussing. Um, there are increasing parliamentary questions occurring around things like all the different devices that were appearing in the home that could be connected to the home Wi-Fi. Um, and what we found from the research we did was a 
where an estimated 13 billion different devices around the world now connect into the internet. And this is everything from your smart TVs, um, which sort of makes sense and makes sense that that connects to the internet. But increasingly, people have so-called smart washing machines and smart fridges um, that can tell you whether you're running low on something and even order it from Tesco's for you. And then there's quite a few children's toys and um, nanny cams and things like that that can connect to your Wi-Fi. So back in 2016, the UK government had committed as part of its five-year national cybersecurity strategy to make sure that all of these new products and services were cyber secure by default by 2021. And when we looked at this last year, um, we found that 42% of households had smart TVs. Um, about a fifth to a quarter of people had some kind of fitness tracker, so something that wasn't necessarily in their smartphone, but a, a Fitbit or something like that, that both allowed you to measure your steps, but could also be used for location um, and marking out routes for running and cycling and things. And then uh, an increasing number of homes also had smart speakers. So these are speakers that are constantly listening, um, ready to be voice activated and obviously have various implications of uh, data being shared through them. And so some of the key problems that we found were the potential for the introduction of various bits of software onto these devices. So for example, there had been some examples of ransomware where people had the default password still set on their device, and then these could be then localized and uh, hacked in some way, and people either you know, at the lowest extreme, they couldn't access their TV anymore or change the channel or it was continuously on. In some extremes, you had home thermostats being taken over. So your heat, heating continuously on. And then people were being asked to pay sums of money um, to actually unlock that. We also found there's quite a significant risk of loss of data. And this is where the data privacy questions come in. So a lot of people had unsecured webcams and baby monitors, again, with default passwords connected to networks. And they were beginning to be whole websites devoted to just searching out um, these webcams that were out there and then using them and displaying their contents. But there were a number of causes for poor cybersecurity. One was actually quote, noted by companies, but quoted by them as not being of importance to consumers. So. 40% of companies felt that customers were just unwilling to pay extra for better secure devices. They wanted a minimal level of security. They might not really understand some of the implications here. Um, and most people don't actually know if their device is secure. People um, are starting to get to grips with the idea of having personal passwords, for example, but they might not realize, for example, that there's a firmware password on their device or a default password that they need to change. Um, there's also a problem with actually the ability to discover when there's flaws and then to correct those. Often, even if you are looking, say, for a car, for instance, it can be quite difficult to update the firmware on your car. It usually needs to be done by a specialist garage. Um, it's not something you can simply connect to the internet and do. And so even if there were issues, actually pushing out software updates to people and getting people to update their fridges firmware was also tricky. So there were some initiatives that were suggested at the end of that. Um, one was to eliminate these non-unique default passwords and force people to either change the password or have unique passwords on each device. Another was for companies to adopt what's called a vulnerability disclosure policy. So this is the openness of a company to have a single point of call where people can say, there's this weakness in your device. This is um, something we've discovered. Can you create a fix to this? And then once that fix is achieved, having a way of automatically updating all the devices that are out there. So if they're connected to the internet, pushing out an update so that you can close those loopholes. And then finally, something that's often not understood is the time frame for which a certain device will be supported for. So obviously, companies are not going to produce software updates ad infinitum for a single device. And so it needs to be quite, companies need to be clear about how long is the current software going to be updated for um, and how long will they provide service for that.